Everyone who is watching this video is in for one heck of a treat. Before we get started with the video, if you don't know who I am, my name is Cole. I'm a 22 year old farmer from central Iowa. I farm with my dad and my younger brother, and I have something I would kinda like to talk about. <laughs> I'm wearing my Pit Viper sunglasses because the sun is super bright and I'd be doing this the whole time and no one wants to see me with my eyes shut. So we got the Pit Vipers on. By the way, if you want to pick up a pair, check out the link in the description. If you use the code Cole the Corn Star, you'll get 10% off. I think a lot of people really misunderstand what actually goes on with the farm's financials. I mean, farmers are driving around with $500,000 combines and $300,000 tractors. They have to be making tons of money, right? Well, that's not always the case. In this video, I'm going to get very personal. I'm going to actually go in behind the scenes on our own 1,700 acre operation. And I'm going to break down all of our income and all of our expenses. And I'm hoping I can shine a little light onto what goes on here on the farm. I would say we're pretty much the average farm. And I'm not here to say our business is perfectly efficient and 100% correct in every way. We definitely have a lot of room to improve. No one's perfect and we are trying our best. Like I said just a little little bit ago this video is very personal and that's because I'm going to be using our farms actual numbers mostly I have a couple rules now the first rule is I'm not going to be using our farms actual income and our actual rent expenses I'm going to be using averages from the Iowa State University extension website they put together some really good stuff there so I'm going to be based off that for the state of Iowa. I really don't care if anyone knows how much money I have or how much money I make, but I do not want to put our farm at a competitive disadvantage compared to all our neighbors. I don't really want them knowing all of our information, so that's why we're doing that. And the second thing is I'm going to be rounding all the numbers to the nearest thousand because no one wants to hear me say $149,251.99 for every single item that we're adding together. It makes a lot of unnecessary chit chat. The third thing, just because our farm is paying for it doesn't mean other farms are paying for it. Remember, not every farm is cookie cutter. And lastly, this video is intended to just show the shell of how the financials behind a farm work. It's not designed to be a pity video at all. In other words, what I'm saying is, please don't feel sorry for me or any other farmer for that matter. I know what goes on on our farm is 100% our responsibility and what applies on our farm isn't going to apply on another farm. Farming in central Iowa is a lot different than farming in western Montana. Oh yeah, I forgot about one last thing. I'm going to be going based off the 2018 crop because I have all the numbers for 2018. All the 2019 numbers are not out yet. Oh yeah, one last, one last thing. I'm going to miss something and I don't always do everything 100% correctly. Nobody does. This is a real life farm in the real life world. So I'm just putting it out there how we do it. So if I do miss something, please feel free to write it down in the comments. Yes, by the way, if you enjoyed this video and learned something from it, could you please give it a thumbs up? This video took me a lot of time to make. Thank you. So farmers get paid when they sell their product. So in our case, when we sell our corn and soybeans. We also get paid when the government pays us. That's right, I said government. Government. Now I know a lot of people get uneasy about that and trust me, we do too. We don't like just receiving a check for doing nothing, but if we don't take that money, it puts us at a severe competitive disadvantage if everyone else is taking that money. And to be completely honest, government payments are really helping a lot of farmers right now because there would be a lot of guys who wouldn't be in business without it. And as far as I'm concerned, I think everyone watching this video likes to eat. So the average corn yield in Iowa for 2018 was 196 bushels an acre, which isn't too bad. And soybeans yielded 57 bushels an acre. So on our farm, we raised 1,200 acres of corn for a total yield of 235,200 bushels of corn. And then we planted 500 acres of soybeans for a total yield of 28,500 bushels. Well, that seemed pretty easy, right? Well, now we have to sell it. So when it comes to selling it, we go based off the Chicago Board of Trade. That's the market that shows the current price of corn and soybeans. Now keep in mind, the price that we see on the Chicago Board of Trade is not what we actually get in our pocket when we sell the grain. There's a thing called 
basis. So let's say the Chicago Board of Trade says corn is $4 a bushel, but there's a lot of local buyers around that don't really need a lot of corn right now, so they're only offering $3 a bushel. That dollar a bushel difference is the basis. So when places are really needing grain, they're gonna have a smaller basis. I've even seen places have a positive basis, meaning they are paying higher than the Board of Trade. But when places don't need grain, they have a low basis. A normal basis is usually around 30 to 70 cents under the Board of Trade. So when the basis is taken out, that makes a cash sale. Now, since some farmers are great marketers, some are average marketers, and most are terrible marketers, I just found the high cash price for 2018, the average, and the low. And then I took all of our bushels, divided it by three, so a third sold at the high, third sold at the average, and a third sold at the low. This might not be the most perfect way to do it, but that's how we're doing it for the simplicity sake of the video. So a third of our 235,200 bushels of corn is 78,400 bushels. According to Iowa State's site, the highest cash price for corn last year was $3.57, the average was $3.41, and the low was $3.24. So all those corn bushels sold for $801,000. And of course we can't forget about soybeans. So out of our 28,500 bushels of soybeans, dividing that into thirds, brings it into 9,500 bushel segments. Now once again, according to Iowa State's website, the high soybean cash price was $9.75, the average was $9.05, and the low was $8.38. So here on the farm, we sold all of our soybeans for $259,000. So when we add our corn sales and our soybean sales, that gives us an income of $1,060,000. Oh, but wait, remember those government government payments I was talking about earlier? This is where they come into play. So in 2018, the United States government government came out with the Market Facilitation Program, AKA MFP payments. So the MFP payments paid a penny per bushel of corn raised in 2018 and $1.65 per bushel of soybeans raised in 2018. So on our farm, the MFP program paid us $2,000 for corn and $47,000 for soybeans. So when we add our MFP payment to the rest of our sales, that brings us to a total income of $1,109,000. Now there is something I want people to keep in mind. When we sell our grain to a buyer, the price we get is for corn that is 100% perfect condition. Say there's a little damage to the corn or there's a little smell or if bugs somehow got in there, all those things can have a dock. So a normal dock is usually five to 15 cents a bushel, but if something's really bad, say a hot spot gets in the middle of a bin, which can easily happen, that dock can be up to 40 cents a bushel. Now in the case of our farm, we can store almost all of our crop in our own grain bins in our own buildings. But there is some grain that we weren't able to store in our own storage because we simply didn't have the room. So we had to bring that grain to the co-op. Now our local co-op is a place that has millions of bushels worth of corn and soybean storage. And so what they do is when we bring our corn in there, they store the grain for us. To store grain at our local co-op, it costs 15 cents a bushel for the first 90 days, no matter what. So if we decided to sell our grain after being in there for 30 days, it still costs us 15 cents a bushel to store it. And then every month that's additional after 90 days is three cents a bushel. So if we decided to store our grain there for an entire year, it would cost us 42 cents a bushel just to have it sitting in storage. So what the hope is by being able to store the grain, a farmer will be able to capture a higher price in the future than what it is right now. So when a farmer has storage on their own farm, while it's not completely free, oftentimes it is significantly cheaper than taking it to a co-op. So now that we've made our $1.1 million, what do we do with it? This is where my expertise comes in. My expertise in spending money. Because farmers have a lot of expenses. Uh, so just to give you guys a little feel for what kind of expenses we're going through here, let's just name them real quick. We got equipment, phones, rent, professional fees, bank loans, fuel, crop insurance, property insurance, employees, trucking expense, repairs, seed, farm supplies, food, utilities, and we can't forget about the miscellaneous expenses. The very first expense that I wanna talk about is equipment. 
Putting together equipment expense for a farm is really difficult because every farm is so different. Some farms run equipment that's 50 years old. Some farmers run equipment that's brand spanking new. Some farmers own some old, some new, some lease, and some don't. Now, I would give you our equipment financial situation, but since we've got a lot of neighbors watching, I really don't want to give that stuff out. So I put together an equipment list for a farm our size on some stuff that's a little newer, some stuff that's a little older, everything we would need for a farm our size. If you want to see the individual items here on the screen, pause it and you can see what I have listed for everything. But with this equipment here, I figured it costs about $900,000 to purchase it all. And let's just assume for the simplicity's sake of this video that half of it's paid off. So $450,000 stretched over a five year equipment plan. That comes out to $50 an acre. Take something like this tractor, for example. If someone were to buy this particular one brand new, it would run over $300,000. The sprayer behind me, try finding one of those for under $200,000. Used. And take the combine behind me. One of these in a 10 year old machine, probably looking at $100,000. So right there, and just these three pieces of equipment, $100,000, $300,000, 200,000, that's 600 grand wrapped up in three pieces of equipment. Now these are all just examples, of course, but what I'm saying is equipment is really expensive. When it comes to equipment, older stuff is a lot cheaper, newer stuff is more expensive, but older stuff has more downtime, more repairs, newer stuff, more uptime, less repairs, a lot more efficient, faster, bigger, and a heck of a lot nicer to ride in, but also a lot more expensive. On any farm, inputs are gonna be one of the most expensive things. So the first major input that we're gonna have is seed. Last year we planted 1,200 acres of corn and that cost us $135,000 in just corn seed. And for the 500 acres of soybeans we had, that cost us $24,000. So as a whole, it cost us $159,000 just for the seed to plant. Now that we've bought some really expensive seed, we wanna make sure that we can get the most yield out of that seed as possible. That's where the machine behind me comes in. This is the sprayer. So we use the sprayer to spray down chemicals to keep weeds out of our fields because weeds rob nutrients from the seeds that we're trying to plant and it causes them to produce a lower yield. During the springtime, I basically live in this thing because I have to spray all of our corn ground and bean ground before we plant. And then after we plant, I come in and I spray it again to keep out the weeds. And then we keep an eye on stuff to make sure stuff doesn't come back because if it does then I have to hit all the ground again. On weed killer for corn we spent $48,000 last year and on weed killer for beans we spent $28,000. That is where organic farming would be really nice because then we wouldn't have to spray down any chemicals and we would be able to eliminate that cost but please keep in mind for organic farming we'd have to go chemical free for three years but during that three-year transition phase we would not be able to get the organic premium because our ground wouldn't be organic certified yet. And also other things to keep in mind when it comes to organic farming is that it requires a lot more time there's a lot more wear and tear on tractors and a lot more diesel fuel is going to be expended in order to keep weeds out of the crop and generally speaking in a well organized organic field yields are going to be about half of what we produce and if weed outbreaks are especially bad it could be even worse than that I don't want anyone to think that I'm anti-organic because I'm not. I think it's absolutely awesome. Just at this point in time, it doesn't make sense for our farm. Also, since we own our own sprayer, we didn't have to pay anyone to applicate for us. Our local applicators charge $6 an acre to spray, and we'd have to go over all of our acres at least twice. So at 1,700 acres hit twice, that's 3,400 acres at $6 an acre. That's what it would cost just to run the machine over those acres. But since we own this one, we don't have to pay that. It's one of the reasons why we own it. And this brings us to our last major input and that's fertilizer. Think of fertilizer as nutrients and vitamins for a plant to grow big, strong, healthy, and yield a lot of corn. There's two different types of fertilizer we put on, dry fertilizer and liquid fertilizer. Dry fertilizer is put on in the fall after we're done harvesting and it's put on with a spreader. A spreader is a machine kind of like those things people use to seed their yards with, with grass where they push and it spins and it kicks seed out. That's basically a small version of what a spreader is. So when the spreaders go out to the field, they're putting on phosphorus and potassium. In farmer speak, we call this P and K. And then they're also putting on pell lime, which is short for pelletized lime. And what that lime is gonna do is balance the pH in the soil. And then it's gonna basically unlock nutrients in the soil for the plant to be able to use. And then we put another product in there that makes the P and K more readily available for the plant. So for the spreader to go back and forth in our fields, it costs $6 an acre. P and K runs at $56 an acre. 
Pell lime is $15 an acre. And then the product we use to make the P&K more readily available, that costs $5 an acre. So for us to put dry fertilizer on, it costs $82 an acre. And the good news here is we only have to put it on our corn acres. So for us to put dry fertilizer on 1,200 acres, it's gonna cost us $98,000. Jump change. So then when it comes to liquid fertilizer, farmers do this different all across the board. There's different ways of putting on liquid fertilizer, but the way we do it is with 32% nitrogen. And that's basically giving the corn steroids. So there's two types of ground we plant on. Corn that was corn the year before, AKA corn on corn, and then corn that was beans the year before, AKA corn on beans. Since corn robs more nitrogen from the soil than beans, we need to supplement more nitrogen back into corn on corn soil than corn on bean soil. So corn on corn soil takes more nitrogen. So for us to put our corn on corn 32%, it costs us $68,000. And for us to put our corn on bean nitrogen, it costs us $22,000. And we also add a zinc additive into all that 32% and that costs an extra $18,000. Oh yeah, remember the sprayer? Most farmers don't own their own sprayer and they hire a co-op to do it for them. So for the co-op to come in and spray the first rate of liquid nitrogen down, it would cost $6 an acre. And then for the second rate of nitrogen when the corn's yay high, it would cost $12.50 an acre. Fortunately for us, since we own our own sprayer, we don't have to pay that. One of the biggest expenses on our farms is cash rent. According to Iowa State University's extension site, they said the average rent in Iowa is $222 an acre. Remember, $222 an acre is an average. Some people pay more, some people pay less. If ground is better, people are willing to pay more. If ground is worse, people are willing to pay less. I've heard of rents being as low as $100 an acre and as high as $500 an acre. There are farmers who own 100% of their acres. There's farmers who rent 100% of their acres. And there's there's farmers who rent some and own some. So in the case of us, we own 1,100 acres and we rent 600 acres. So what we do on Corn Star Farms is we try to keep our land payments equivalent to what our cash rent average is. So when we have some farms that we owe a lot of money on and we have some farms that we owe a little bit of money on, we try to get that to average together to equal our cash rent average. So in this case, it's $222 an acre. So for 1,700 acres at $222 an acre, that costs us $377,000. Cole, if land is so expensive to rent, why don't you just go to a landlord and have them lower the price of rent? That's a really good idea, but it's not that easy. The best thing I can compare it to is try going to a landlord on a house and saying, hey, lower the rent for me. Good luck. There are some landlords who are really good to work with and will work with the farmer on their rents and understand when prices are low, they're not gonna be able to pay as much for rent and when prices are high, they're gonna be able to pay a little more. And since we own 1,100 acres, we get a delightful thing called property taxes. So for property taxes, we pay $32 an acre over 1,100 acres for a total cost of $35,000 a year in property taxes. That's expensive. And not only is that bad enough, but since we're buying 1,100 acres at $222 an acre on a 25 year mortgage, that means we have to pay taxes on it. 1,100 acres at $222 an acre is $244,000. So basically dad shows an income of $244,000. So for lack of simpler terms here, dad pays taxes on $244,000. Dad is able to deduct interest as a tax deduction, but but it's really not that significant in the grand scheme of things. So after doing a quick and dirty tax analysis on this, dad is paying $60,000 a year in income tax after buying this ground. Now I know people are gonna argue that, well, Cole, that's going into equity, which is going towards your dad's net worth. So you're ultimately making money at the end of the day. And I mean, yeah, you're right. But at the same time, net worth doesn't really mean a whole lot to a farmer because we're never planning on selling any of this stuff. So it's money that goes into something. And, and yes, on paper, it is adding to our net worth, but it's kind of like having a $3 million Bugatti that you're not allowed to sell. And it honestly really takes a farmer to understand that net worth really doesn't mean anything. I know this might get a lot of people fired up, but at the end of the day, we're never looking at our net worth because net worth doesn't pay the bills and we're never planning on selling it anyway. So it doesn't really matter what it's worth. We're just looking at the cash flow. 
I could talk about the advantages of owning versus renting and vice versa, but that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother video. Am I the only one speaking when I say I love paying the license and registration fees on all of our vehicles, especially when you have four semis, five trailers, and 10 vehicles? Yeah, it adds up. We spend $6,000 a year on license and registration fees. I don't know if a lot of people know this or not, but farmers don't just have that million dollars we sold in grain sitting around in the bank account all year, and then we subtract out of it as expenses come. We sell throughout the year as it goes, so that means there's a lot of times during the year where we don't have money to buy things. Hence when the $377,000 rent payment comes around and we only have $20 sitting in the bank account, that means we have to borrow it. We call that an operating note. So the interest we pay on our operating note throughout the year is just about $36,000. I know that interest can be used as a tax write-off too, but I'm not gonna get into any of that stuff. I am not a CPA and I'm not a tax expert, so I'm just not gonna go there, but keep in mind there is a tax aspect to some of this stuff too. So on our farm, we have seven tractors, a combine, a sprayer, 10 vehicles, a backhoe, two skid loaders. What else am I forgetting? And a lawnmower. And guess what? They have one thing in common. They all use fuel. So on our farm in 2018, we spent $41,000 on fuel. So the next time someone goes to the gas station and sees their fuel bill over $100, just think, someone's got it worse. A lot worse. And yes, there are tractors and trucks that are a lot more fuel efficient, but keep in mind that's another expense when it comes to buying equipment. Not only is fuel really expensive for us, insurance is, whew, insurance is expensive. So on the farm we have crop insurance and then we have property insurance. Now believe me when I say insurance isn't something we have to try to make a lot of money off of. Between crop insurance and property insurance we spend $40,000 a year. See this? Yep, a cell phone. Basically couldn't farm without it. So our phones tied with the internet cost us $5,000 a year. For 2018, we paid $16,000 in total labor. So on the farm from time to time, we have projects that we are not capable of doing ourselves because either we don't have the time to do it or we don't have the equipment to do it. We call this category custom work. So say that someone comes and helps us plant corn, someone helps us harvest some beans, someone brings out their bulldozer and excavator to tear down some trees and fix some waterways for us. All of this stuff applies. Last year we spent $12,000 on custom work. Do you guys want to know my absolute favorite thing about going to the lawyer and the accountant? That's right, you guessed it, paying for it. We spent $3,000 last year in professional fees. See this building? See all these tools? See all these parts? We don't just have all this stuff for show, we use it so that way we can fix our equipment. When it comes to equipment, the more we use something, the more it's gonna break, and the older something is, the more likely it's gonna break. Well, not always with the old stuff, because some of the old stuff is made the best and it lasts a lot longer than the new stuff, but you get what I'm saying. On our farm, we run a wide variety of equipment. Some of it's newer, some of it's older, and we try to do as many of our own repairs as we possibly can, hence why we built this shop. Because if we have to take something to a shop to have it worked on, most places charge $120 an hour. And when it comes to semis, there are semi places that charge almost $200 an hour. Last year was a pretty expensive year for us when it came to repairs. We just had a lot of stuff go wrong and sometimes that just happens. So we spent $75,000 on repairs in 2018. Well, Cole, if you had newer equipment, your repair bill would be a lot lower. And that may be true, but new equipment is also really expensive and oftentimes repairs are cheaper than buying something new. And new equipment still does break. We try to run equipment as long as we can and once it starts giving us more fits than what it's worth, then that's when we upgrade to something newer. Now on the farm during the busy season, staying up and running is the name of the game. So we carry a lot of parts and supplies. In 2018, we spent $5,000 on supplies. This brings us to one of our bigger expenses and that is trucking. On Corn Star Farms, we have four semis, yet we hire out all of our grain to be hauled away. Why do we do that? And the first reason is none of our semis are in the shape that I would want to take them on a 130 mile round trip multiple times a day all throughout the year because, well, they're old. Then they would need quite a bit of money put into them in order to get them DOT inspection worthy. I mean, I guess we could buy new trucks, but you guys just saw how expensive semis are. And even if we did buy newer trucks, there's also a thing called time. So the place we haul to is 65 miles away. It's a 130 mile round trip. And some days there's a three to four hour line. We'd be hauling grain all the time and we wouldn't have time to do anything else on the farm. 
and we have more to do than just haul grain. Which that brings up the argument of, well, why do you haul so far away? The particular place we're bringing it to often has a 30 cent premium over our local co-op. Meaning, we can hire a trucker, not using our own trucks, not using our own time, giving someone else a job, pay them 22 cents a bushel to haul down there for us, and then we get paid 30 cents a bushel more than our local co-op. So even after paying the trucker 22 cents a bushel, we are still profiting eight cents a bushel over bringing it to our local co-op. In other words, what I'm saying is it costs us more money to bring it to our local co-op. So it's a win-win situation all the way around for us to bring it to the place further away. Oh yeah, I almost forgot to mention, we spent $85,000 on trucking last year. You guys see that right there? That's a light. That light requires electricity. You guys see this hand? You see how beautiful the skin is on my hand? That's because I had water to drink. Electricity, water, yeah, that's our utilities. We spent $10,000 on utilities last year. Keep in mind that it's for four farm yards, two houses, two shops, grain dryer, three bin fans. Yeah, you get the point. Now, before we talk about everything that's happened in this video, there are two expenses that are a little bit different on our farm than on most farm. And part of that is because of our location. And the second part is just our farm management decisions that we make here on Cornstar Farms. So the first thing that a lot of people do is tillage. We run no-till here on our farm, so therefore we don't run any tillage. Tillage can run anywhere from $10 to $20 an acre, depending on what you're pulling out in the field and what kind of tractor you're using. There's a lot of variabilities, different soil types, ground moisture, whatever. But for the simplicity's sake, we'll just say it costs $15 an acre to run tillage. Since we don't have to do any of that, we're able to save a lot of expense there. And the second thing is, due to us being located in central Iowa, oftentimes we have really nice weather in the fall and that allows our corn to dry down meaning we don't have to dry our corn as much and sometimes we don't have to dry our corn at all so in 2018 we didn't have to dry a single bushel of corn but there are a lot of farmers who have to dry every single bushel of corn they have and drying can get really expensive if someone has to take corn to the co-op to be dried our local co-op charges four cents a point so if corn is 25 percent moisture and it has to be brought down to 15 percent moisture they have to dry at 10 points that costs 40 cents a bushel and to add in insult to injury when corn is wetter is bigger and when they dry it down it shrinks so then they have a shrink factor added to that but I'm not an expert when it comes to shrink so I'm going to be conservative and just not include that. We'll say the co-ops being nice and just waves the shrink fee. And then there's some farmers like us who have on-site drying and we're able to dry our corn for four and a half cents a bushel. So it's significantly cheaper for us to own our own dryer and dry our own corn than to take it to the co-op. But keep in mind you have to have bins for it which are really expensive, you have to have a dryer which is really expensive, you have to have all the electricity hookup, the LP hookup, and all that stuff's an expense. So there's pros and cons to both sides. But in 2018, we were lucky enough to not have to dry any bushels, so we saved a lot of money there too. Yes, this number is real. All right, Cole, all jokes aside now, there's no way a farm is losing $239,000 and is still in business. Well, guys, like I said, these were actual numbers of what we spent here on our farm this year, so this number is real. Now just imagine someone who harvested a crop that was 20 bushels less than the numbers we're going off of. Really bad day for them. So I know everyone's wondering, how's a farm able to continue going on if this is the reality for it? And frankly, there's a lot of farms that aren't. And this loss of money trend isn't anything new. It's been going on for the past six years. And really there's only about four things that have been keeping people afloat. And the first one is having good financers. Having a financer that is able to work with the grower, that is able to refinance things out longer to make payments lower, to help a farmer scoot by. Those kind of deals have been really helping a lot of farmers scoot along. And the second one being is most farmers have more than one source of income, meaning they're working more than one job. I know in the case of our farm, we have a few investments that cash flow. We have our grave digging business. I have my YouTube channel. My brother has his hay baling business. And then Mama Corn Star works full time. So everyone watching really needs to give Mama Corn Star a high five, a hug, and a thank you. Because without her job, the farm wouldn't be here. There were a few years where we were so tight financially that it was mom's income that kept the farm afloat. So thank you, mom. The third thing that's keeping farmers afloat is government payments. This $239,000 loss is with a $49,000 government payment. Take that government payment out, we're getting close to $300,000. Ouch. And the fourth thing is praying. 
As a farmer, we have to have faith in God because without him, we wouldn't have any of it in the first place. And our relationship with Jesus Christ is the only thing that we really have in this world and the only thing that we're gonna be able to carry with us. Therefore, it's the most important thing. And I know on our farm, praying is something I do every day. I know from the outside looking in at all of our expenses and stuff, it just looks like our business is all over the place. It's terribly inefficient. We're not effective. I mean, how can a business lose $239,000 a year? And you would be 100% correct by saying a lot of that is our fault because it is. But there also are factors that are beyond our hands. Things like the weather and the markets are things that we simply can't control. And yes, we can always become better marketers, but the weather, mother nature kind of does what she wants. So when it comes to the farm as a whole, there are a lot of things we can improve on. One of the biggest things we can do is raise a better crop. We need to be learning more about the science that goes in behind raising a crop and how we as growers can raise a better crop. Something as simple as applying fertilizers that are more effective or maybe utilize fungicide to keep a healthier plant or something as easy as doing soil samples or tissue samples to figure out what our soil is lacking or what our plants are lacking for nutrients. So what we can do with all that stuff is take that information, analyze it, and then we can figure out what we need to be doing better for the next year in order to raise a better crop. And like I said just a little bit ago, Mother Nature is the biggest factor, but we can have all of our other ducks in line, so when Mother Nature's in line, we'll have everything else ready to go. The second thing we can really improve on on our farm here is marketing. So two years ago, we hired a third-party marketing firm and we have been so happy ever since we did that. We hire professionals for everything else in our lives, right? We hire a lawyer, we hire an accountant, why not hire someone who's a professional marketer? Before we went through a marketing firm, we did everything on cash sales and our sales were so strung out and we would have carryover corn from the year before and then we wouldn't have enough room to store our corn at home and so we'd be sending a bunch to the co-op, which is really expensive as we just saw before. And we were just flat out bad at marketing. So once we decided to take a step forward and use a marketing service, we started utilizing Hedging. Hedging has been the difference maker for our farm these past two years. If you don't know anything about hedging and you're a farmer, please go learn about it. If you don't wanna learn about it, go find someone who knows about it because it is the biggest marketing tool that we have used on our farm, hands down, honestly, probably ever. Fun fact, you can make money off the market when it's going down by utilizing hedging. I'm telling you, look into it. And then lastly, the third thing we can do is simply tighten up our belts. Maybe I can keep Daddy Cornstar away from a few more auctions so he doesn't have to do impulse auger buys all the time. Or maybe I can keep Cooper out of the parts store so he's not buying so many tools all the time. Those $500 purchases just really add up over time and they make a big difference as time goes on. Just for the fun of it, I crunched some numbers just to see what kind of prices, what kind of yield we would need in order to break even. And before I get started in that, I just want to brush on something real quick. Farmers don't do what they do for the money. Frankly, in farming, most years, there's not any money in it at all. And yes, every now and again, there are a few years that are really prosperous for farmers. I mean, look at a lot of things in our operation. We wouldn't have been able to afford them had we not had years that were prosperous. But with that being said, keep in mind, my grandfather farmed for 60 years. And then when my dad was 10 years old, he started farming. So he's been farming for 45 years. So between my dad and grandpa, that's 105 years of blood, sweat, and tears that have been put into the farm, and they worked 100% together their entire life. So everything we have on the farm today is because of them. I can't take credit for anything that's gone on because that's all been on them. I'm just taking the farm from where it's at now, and I'm figuring out all the ways we can improve it and make it better from there. All right, let's get back to the number crunching here. What do we gotta do to get out of the red? Well, basically we have two options. We can get a higher yield, or we can raise the price. So first, let's try raising the yield and keep our same average prices. Since we plant 70% corn and 30% beans, that's how I made up the ratios on how much is needed from each crop. So if we're gonna keep an average price of $3.41 for corn, we need to raise $168,000 in order to reach break even. So in order to do that, we'd have to increase our production 41 bushels an acre, giving us a total yield of 237 bushels an acre. And for soybeans, we'd need to raise 8,000 more bushels or a 16 bushel an acre increase. And that would bring our total soybean yield to 73 bushels an acre. And when it comes to keeping the same yield but raising the price for corn, we would need to raise the price 71 and a half cents 
or have $4.13 corn. And for soybeans, we would need to raise the price $2.49 or have $11.55 beans. Those prices are very possible. Corn and soybeans can fluctuate a ton and they can do it very quickly. And in 2019, we have seen some of that in corn, but soybeans have a ways to go. Now I hope everyone who's watched this video now kind of understands the shell of how the financials behind a farm work. Remember, every farm is different, but there you have it. That's what we do. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you have any questions, need clarification on something, or just have any suggestions in general, please write it down in the comments. And if you guys like this style of video, please let me know. This is a lot different than what I normally do, but I enjoy making these, so let me know. And then lastly, if you wanna stay tuned for the journey of our farm, please hit the subscribe button. That way you'll be notified when I post, and then you'll be able to tune right in and keep up with our journey. Thanks for watching, everybody. Oh,